Let's open our Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. This morning we're going to be talking about pressing on in Christ. Let me read verses 12 through 21, then we'll pray, and uh, then we'll dive into the Word of God. The Apostle Paul is writing to Christians at the church at Philippi, talking about his own spiritual condition, his, his own growth, and, and that he has a, a holy dissatisfaction. He wants to keep growing in his relationship with Jesus. And so he says, Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and preaching forward, reaching forward, preaching forward. <laughs> he did that too. Reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Let me pray for our time together. Thank you, Lord, that you're working in our lives, every life that is submitted to you, every life that's surrendered to you, Lord. You are actively and energetically working, causing us to, to yearn after your plans, causing us to, to have faith, encouraging us to have faith, Lord. I pray, Father, that you'd bless our time together in your word. Pray for Pastor Rob, as he is very ill this morning, that you'd uh, heal him and, and uh, let him be encouraged. God, thank you uh, that he is here leading this church, and we pray your blessings over him and Jessica, Father, and we pray your blessings over our time today, Lord, that we will have been better for having been here today. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul, I'm a little weak in the voice today. Could you just boost it just a touch? I feel like i got to push a little hard, and it's probably not a good idea. The Apostle Paul says in verse 12 that he's pressing on. Let me read that verse again. Not that I have already attained but I'm, or I'm already perfected, but I press on. I want to lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. We do well to understand some of the, the, the definitions of words and phrases. He says, I press on. Figurator figuratively, it means one who runs a race swiftly to reach a goal. It's, it's a very deliberate action. It's a moving in a direction with a goal in mind. It's not a, uh, dare I say, uh, a woman meandering at the mall. Did I make enemies? Okay. <laughs> you ever seen those little things on social media? A woman at the mall, she's like this. A guy just goes, you know, to, to the shoe store and then out, you know, and a, a gender, gen, you know, generalization. I'm just kind of kidding. Unless you think it's funny, then I'm, then I'm serious. But... Um, <laughs> You know, we can meander through life and we can just kind of be attracted by this or be attracted by that or there's always somebody that's trying to encourage us to be some, involved with something or be a part of something or, you know, what have you. A lot of good things, some of them are useless, some of them are very good, but um, it's possible to meander through life. We don't want to be meandering through life. We want to press on. The Bible says to seek the Lord while he may be found. The Bible says to follow after Christ. Jesus said, follow me. And so the Christian life is a life of deliberate intentionality, to press on. And Paul says here that he's like a runner running a race or going after something. He has a goal in mind. Imagine how silly it would be if uh, you go to the Olympics or something like that and people line up at the starting line, but then some of them decide to, to run reverse around the, <laughs> the track or something or, or to run up in the stands or run to the snack bar or something like that. There's, there's not a chance of them winning. 
And so Paul says, I run deliberately, I run swiftly. Spiritually speaking, of course, it means to press forward in the Christian faith. It means to grow spiritually. And so he says, I haven't attained yet. I haven't reached my highest closeness to God. I haven't, uh, you know, reached the pinnacle of, Christian, of the Christian life. And so I'm pressing on. I'm going forward. I'm pushing What's the opposite of pressing on? It means, to be just, it means to be spiritually indifferent or uninterested or lazy. It means to be content that God has forgiven me, Jesus has forgiven me of my sins, I'm, I'm going to heaven, I have repented, I don't believe in any other religion or any other spiritual uh, you know, organization or anything like that. I don't think I can earn my salvation, I know that, and so I have said yes to Jesus, and. I've told them that I'm sorry for my sins, but I'm quite content to sit on the couch. I'm even kind of content to go to the, to the race and sit in the bleachers and watch others run the race. And, you know, on a good day, I might even put on my track shoes and put on my track outfit and actually line up on the starting block and, and look like a runner, but I'm really not a runner. I'm just hanging around the runners. And so Paul says, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to hang around. I'm not going to just dress up, if you will, like an athlete. I'm not going to just, uh, you know, appear to be sympathetic to the cause. I'm going to run. I'm going to be very, very deliberate. To, to not press on, some people suppose that spiritual growth is not important. I'm, I'm sad about, you know, Christians, and, and we all know some Christians that, um, said yes to Jesus and, and, and put on, I'm going to use the runner you know, illustration, if I may, for a while. They put on the, the running clothes. They bought the good shoes. They, they, they studied about running, and, and they got you know, a, a, a smart watch, and they can check their heartbeat, and they know how to do all of these things, but they don't have any intention of running. Maybe a light jog now and then, but certainly you don't want to go too hard at it. And that's, dear, dear brothers and sisters, that's not, the way to run the, that's not the way to live the Christian life. None of us were saved. If you're a Christian today, you're never saved to sit up in the bleachers. You're saved to, to run the race. We read about that in Hebrews chapter 12. To put off everything that so easily besets us and run with endurance. Uh, the name of Joe's band, run with patient endurance, with the deliberateness, I'm going to run after Jesus Christ. And so if in any way you find yourself coasting, um, you shouldn't be. And even if it's a time of rest in your life and a time of sabbatical and a time of non-involvement, be very deliberate about that. It's okay to rest. To, to rest doesn't mean you're not involved. If God has directed you to rest, then you deliberately rest. Maybe get off social media for a while. Maybe get off some, some of your hobbies and get a spiritual a refreshment and that kind of thing. So to rest doesn't even mean that you're not in the race, if you will, and now the metaphor breaks down a little bit, but it doesn't mean you're not in the race. It just means that you're deliberately resting. It just means to deliberately follow after Jesus. And not by the thousands of emails that we get or the, the little games on Facebook or any of those things that are not bad in and of themselves, but we can be so distracted that we are meandering all over, all over the world and not running towards a goal. And so it's, it's, it's really uh, required of us to, to, to be seeking God and to say, Lord, why am I here? Why am I here? So Paul says, I press on. Look at verse 12 again. Not that I have already attained. I'm not already perfected, but I press on. I'm deliberate. I want to lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. What a wonderful thing to realize what God has laid hold of you for. I want to encourage you to be serving the Lord. And, and some people would say, well, what, what, what do I have to do? My first question is to seek the Lord. And my next, my next question would be, what do you like to do? What do you like to do? You like to hold babies and change diapers? God bless you. <laughs> Talk to Sarah. <laughs> Clean out your storage unit. Sell some stuff and go to Romania for a month and help them and love babies. And, and there's, there's been a lot of studies that have said children that don't get touched and held and loved 
They're delayed in, in uh, emotional development, in, in uh, speaking skills, in cognitive skills. In so many ways, they don't develop like a normal child who's held and loved. So if you love changing diapers, you're a special person if you love changing diapers. Uh, I thought that was funny anyway. Um, you, you know, if you love just holding those babies, talk to Sarah. If you love swinging a hammer and, and, and doing mortar and block work and building a building, talk to her. Here's an opportunity for you. Find out how much it is to fly to wherever you have to fly. Begin budgeting some things. Let your life be changed. Be deliberate. Don't meander. So Paul says, I'm not going to meander. Look at verse 13. What an amazing verse. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. I'm not there. Dear brothers and sisters, none of us are there. Would you agree? Hey, say amen if you agree. None of us are there. We haven't, none of us have peaked out. Sorry, I have a really dry throat today. None of us have reached the pinnacle of our Christian faith. And certainly Paul, I mean, what an accomplished servant of Jesus Christ. He said, I haven't reached the pinnacle of my Christian faith. I don't consider myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. What a singleness of mind and a singleness of life. If, if we can say this is the one thing I do, it can gather a lot of things under it. I serve Jesus. I bought a fishing boat, and so I take kids from the youth group fishing because I want to share Christ with them. I like to go bowling, but I, I invite people bowling because um, I want to encourage them and be a friend and talk about Jesus and take them out to eat afterwards and tell them my testimony. We can incorporate everything in our lives, unless it's blatantly sinful, for the purposes of Christ. And that you, but we have to be able to say, one thing I do. I'm deliberately going after Christ. And part of that for the Apostle Paul was in verse 13, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. We forget the mistakes of yesterday unless we can learn from them. Learn from your mistakes and then move on. Don't stay there and feel bad. It's, it's not going to do you any good. It's going to be a damaging thing to you. The runner doesn't look back to see where he tripped because <laughs> he'll, likely he'll trip again. At least he'll slow down. The runner doesn't look back to see who he has passed. He doesn't look too much at his past victories because he'll slow down. The runner looks at the finish line. We are not depending on the victories of yesterday to carry us through to today. We are not settling for yesterday's spiritual growth, but pressing on today. <clears throat> Some of us, perhaps, in, 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 with our lives, in our lives in Christ, had what we would call the glory days. Guys, these are the glory days. We, we might say, oh yeah, I, you know, some of us boomer generation, we might say, yeah, I was saved during the Jesus movement. Boy, those were the good old days. Guys, these are the good old days. Today. These are the days that God has given you. We don't want to live in the glory of however God used us before and just, and, the, and, and that's it. And just, you know, walk around our home polishing our trophies? No. God has us here today to keep running. And to, as long as you're here, we're running the, we're running the race. We're in the race until he, until he takes us home. It says of, the, of, of King David in the book of Acts, and after he had served his generation, he fell asleep, which means he died. When he was done serving, then the Lord said, okay, now you're done, let's go home. But he served until the last moment. And that should be typifying our lives. Paul had an honest assessment of his present life. Look at verse 12 again. Not that I have already attained. He said, I'm not there. I haven't reached the pinnacle of my Christian life. Look at verse 13. He said it again. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. A paraphrase of verse 12a could be, not that I lay hold of spiritual maturity and have become spiritually complete, needing no further progress. That was Paul's assessment of himself. Verse 13, that word apprehended, it means to take hold of an opponent and take him to the ground. I haven't reached the pinnacle of my, of my Christian life. I don't have a perfect grasp on spiritual maturity and completeness. It's very impressive when you consider all that Paul endured for Jesus. You can read about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Traveling all over Europe and, and uh, East Asia or Western Asia and um, planting churches and being persecuted and the physical beatings, 
going without food, uh, going without sleep, uh, going without a place to stay, uh, shipwrecked and, and floating in the ocean uh, three days and three nights, uh, persecution, opposition from uh, fellow Jews and from Gentiles and Judaizers, the spiritual religious uh, elite of Israel and all this opposition and he endured it all and just kept going and going and going and most of us would have just said that's enough I quit I can't keep going and he kept pushing and pushing and pushing and he says but I'm still not there yet I hope this doesn't sound like there's some pinnacle that we need to reach or some uh, level of recognition that we're hoping for or some you know award from the church that we're that we're you know going after or something like that it almost sounds as i'm listening to myself uh and it, it's good to listen to yourself once in a while uh you know and i'm doing that right now and i'm thinking this isn't uh this isn't you know uh, uh you know like american idol or something we're you know we're not going for this you know i am the best kind of thing it's not that at all it's the idea of our apprehension of christ is never finished until we're in his presence it's that idea. Just because Paul would say, I've gone without food, I haven't slept, I've been beaten, uh, they stoned me, I was in the ocean, just because I did all these things, it doesn't mean that I can't get any closer to Jesus. That's a better way to say it. I can get closer to Jesus. I can have his life just uh, swoop me up. I can, you know, be in better fellowship with him. I can have a better sense of the leading of the Spirit of God. I can have more peace. Here we are in January. I can have more self-control. I ate a box of macaroni at 11 last night. <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> I can have more, anybody? Self-control. <laughs> a couple of honest people out there. Lord, there's so much more that you want to do in me. I, I'm not there. I'm still in the race. The Bible never teaches us spiritual perfectionism. It never says that. And there's some movements in Christendom that, that say that we can reach that place where we are, are sinless, and it's just not true. And sadly, some Christians give the impression that they never struggle, and, and it's hypocritical. That's why I confess my bad eating habits before you. <laughs> But to press on spiritually, you must realize that you're not spiritually full grown. A young child is a complete person, but they're not a, a mature person. And we even see that with my generation, don't we, with, the, with us boomer folks. There's a lot of people that know a lot of the Bible, but you know, uh, and he, this might sound a little harsh, but hey, you know, the truth kind of stings a little bit sometimes. There's a lot of Christians, even older Christians, we seem to change churches a lot. Or we seem to be hard to get along with. Or our friends always take us with a grain of salt. You know how so-and-so is. And we know a lot about the Bible, but that doesn't mean we're mature. Are we being conformed? Are you? Am I being conformed into the, into the image of Christ? Am I more like Jesus? The only time Jesus offended people, I think, probably was just telling them the truth about, about themselves that they needed to hear. And they were only offended if they were proud congratulating themselves but dear brothers and sisters if you find you know people being standoffish from you maybe it's time just simply like Paul's doing to just say to yourself you know I'm just not there yet Lord you, there's some things you need to do in my life let's go back to the metaphor of the runner for a moment if we may a lot a lot is needed to be you know a world-class athlete and let's stick with running first of all there has to be a degree of God-given talent and so uh, what's the spiritual parallel for that? Well, we have the Spirit of God and God's working in you. So there's some runners, I'm sure, that they love to run and they love to cross the finish line. And if you've ever seen the runners, they lean into the tape like that when they cross the finish line. Um, there's some great YouTube videos of people celebrating too soon. It's very humorous. They're, they're doing like this, you know, three steps from the finish line and somebody else leans into the tape and they, and they lose the race. However, you know, there's lots of aspects to running. I was thinking about maybe a guy loves to run, loves to lean into the tape, but he hates working on, his, on starting in the blocks. 
And so what does he do? He practices running. He runs the bleachers. He does leg presses. He does all these things. He has a great diet. He has the best track shoes. He's really good at leaning into the tape, but he doesn't want to work on, on his start from, with a starting gun. He doesn't want to work on, you know, exploding out of the blocks. He just doesn't like it. He's not going to get any better. And, and it's like us spiritually saying, I want the icing but not the cake, you know. And so to, to pursue Jesus, maybe some of us need to realize, you know, to say, number one, I haven't apprehended. And number two, I don't want to keep working on the things that I'm good at. I need to maybe work on some things that I've neglected or are less savory for me. I love fellowship, but I don't like reading the Bible. I love worshiping, but I don't want to serve. I love going here and there, but I don't, I'm not going to give any money to the Lord. I love people who have faith, but I don't want to have faith. I don't want to step out in faith. I don't want to go change diapers in Romania. But if I catch something, you'll catch something here, guys. You can catch something anywhere. You, you hear what I'm saying? And so imagine the runner, the coach would say, you're a good runner, you lean into the tape, you have a good diet, you run the bleachers, you have strong legs, but you're a terrible starter. That's what you need to do. No, I don't want to work on that. Okay. You seem to know it all. And so, guys, it's, it's just we need to, we need to measure ourselves. We need, we need to assess ourselves. The runner needs to go back and watch the video. Why did I lose that race? I'm stronger than that guy. I'm faster than that guy. And his coach would say, you're a bad starter. That's what you need to work on. Oh, I don't want to work on that. Well, you're not really apprehending it then, are you? I think we probably always kind of, you know, go after the things that are more pleasant for us and neglect the things that are not. And guys, it's just a healthy thing. It's just a real healthy thing to ask the Lord, Lord, show me, you know, uh, those things that I've neglected and I kind of don't like working on and maybe I have trouble getting along with people or maybe I don't have, you know, I'm not generous like I should be or maybe I'm too selfish with my time or maybe I'm too lazy and I don't want to read your word and Lord show me about those things that I neglect because I want the, the entirety of me to pursue the entirety of you. That's reasonable, don't you think? That was a rousing response. <laughs> Come on now, right? Isn't it, isn't it, shouldn't we give all of ourselves? Are you a follower of Jesus? Shouldn't you give all of yourselves to Jesus? Yes or no? Yes. yes, of course, of course. But sometimes we need it pointed out to us. And sometimes that pointing out can be a little, a little prickly. Paul had a great intentionality to press on to the future. Verses 12 to 14, he says, I want to lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. I don't count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, I forget the things which are behind, reaching forward, leaning forward to those things which are ahead. I press. He doesn't say I meander towards the goal. He says I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I'm pressing into it. I'm very deliberate about my life. What was Paul seeking to accomplish? I, I listed some verses there for you guys. These are some goals for us all. These are, this is, these are the intentions of God for us. Romans 6, 4, even so, we should walk in the newness of life. So there's an old life that we used to live in, and if you're in Christ now, there's a newness of life. Walk in that life. Romans 8, 29, it's God's intention that we be conformed to the image of his Son. Our, our, if you're a Christian, your life should increasingly be looking like Jesus. And once again, I think there's areas where we all have our more natural strengths that look rather Jesus-ish. And then there are other areas in our lives where we don't look so much like Jesus. And, and maybe that's where we need to pay attention. Acts 9.15 uh, God said about Paul, He is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. And so Paul knew what his life was about. It's a wonderful thing to know what your life is supposed to be about. If you're a father, it's pretty well laid out in the scriptures. One of your main responsibilities is towards, uh, well, if you're a husband, uh, towards your wife, and then if you have children, towards your children. Really clear. Right, way at the top of the list. Moms, wives, to your husband, to your children, etc. There's so many things that are very, very clear, 
And, you, you know, you may say, I can't go to, to Romania to, to help those babies. I have babies at home. Praise the Lord. Take care of those babies at home. Make sure they are the best loved, best taught, best taken care of kids on the block. That's your ministry. And give it to Jesus and take, take delight in it. Philippians 3, 11, uh, the Apostle Paul talked about resurrection from the dead and glory in heaven. And so he, he understood what his life was about. If the Olympic runner uh, gets an invitation and makes, you know, makes friends with a shot putter and says, you know, you, you're quite an athlete. Um, you could really, you know, push that, that lead ball out there. The runner says, no, that's not what my life's about. This is, this is what I do. This is, this is the thing that I do. And so, guys, whatever invitations you have or whatever options you have or whatever, you know, uh, places you can go or things you can do or people that, you know, you get involved with, you need to know, you need to say, Lord, is this, is this my lane? Lord, I want to run in my lane. I want to run for that goal that you've given me. As I have transitioned out of being a senior pastor and now uh, assisting Pastor Rob here and Pastor Dan and the others and teaching on Wednesday nights and helping with worship and this and that, I'm also like a missionary pastor now. And I've, 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 got, I've got a lot of invitations to go to different places, but a lot, most of them I say no to. Lord, I, I don't want to go unless you say to go. And I don't want to do things just because there's a need and because somebody thinks it'd be you know, a great idea for me to go over there and help. I don't want to do that. I want to pray about everything. I want to run in my lane. I want to, to use the gifts that you've given me and not try to be somebody that I'm not. I need to know my identity in Christ, first of all, as a son and then as a servant. And then I want to run in my lane. And in that lane, man, I'm going to run, I want to run hard. And I think that's what the Bible teaches us, guys. We need to intentionally press on to what's next. And to my boomer uh, brethren and sistren, <laughs> we raised our kids. Praise the Lord. They're on their own. Praise the Lord. If we have grandchildren, we get to visit them. Praise the Lord. Now you have more time to serve God. If you're retired, you're not retired from the service of God. There is no retirement from the service of God. You have experience. You have wisdom. If you played your cards right, you have money. If not, you can tell others how to play their cards right. <laughs> the older generation has a lot to give to the church. So we don't, you know, I, I'm not a fan of the idea of, you know, you reach a certain age and all you do is go golfing and shopping. I'm not a fan of that. I don't think the Bible teaches us that. There's nothing wrong with golfing or shopping. If you play golf, do it for Jesus. And thank him for every blade of grass and every leaf on every tree. And take somebody with you and share the love of Christ with them. You see what I'm saying? We're never out of the service of the Lord. It doesn't matter how old we are. And even if you're infirm and laid up in your deathbed, you're praying and receiving visitors and worshiping God. The, whole, the entirety of our lives. We want to be looking forward. We're not going to be looking backwards except to learn from our lessons, learn from our mistakes. Look at verse 20 and 21. He says, our citizenship is in heaven. He's looking forward. From which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus. Are you looking forward to seeing Jesus? The Christian has so much to look forward to. Check this out. I'm all for this one. Verse 21. Who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able to even subdue all things to himself. There's nothing that won't be subdued by Jesus. There's nothing that won't come under his power and dominion and his lordship. If he can subdue all the demonic angels, the fallen angels that rebelled against God, if he can defeat all the armies of mankind, he can certainly give you a glorified body. I'm all for that. Bobby Knight was a, was a, a brother that used to visit our church. He, he was mentally impaired. He probably had the mind of a seven or an eight-year-old. Who, who remembers Bobby? Okay, Bobby was a local celebrity. But he worried so much, you know, and uh, what, if they, what are we going to do if they turn the lights off? What are we going to do if they run out of oil? I said, Bobby, then we're going to light candles. It'll be okay. And Bobby, one day, God's going to come back and he's going to change our bodies. And you and me are going to have 28-inch waists. <laughs> and good knees and straight teeth. <laughs> Some of you, I, you guys should see my view from here. Some of you are like, ah. <laughs> no more dentists, no more dentists. <laughs> 
No more Dennis there. We are going to see the king. <laughs> Stole that from Roby Duke. We have a citizenship in heaven. We have things to do here, guys, but our home is there. Don't run like this is your home. This is not your home. This is not your home. You got to fix the fence. You got to paint the house. You got to pull the weeds. I understand all of that. But this isn't your home. We, we take pleasure in some things. We take pleasure in having nice houses and, and cars that run and all those things. Yes, 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 but this isn't your home. And so we don't run with a deliberateness of thinking that there's some finish line that we're going to cross here. We're not going to cross a finish line here. The finish line that we do cross here, if you will, takes us into eternal life. That's the finish line that we want to aim for. So Paul spent his time for heavenly things. Look at verse 15 with me, if you would, please. Therefore, let us, as many are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal this even to you. The word if there literally means since. It's kind of a foregone conclusion, and so let me read that and paraphrase it. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, and since in anything, if you think otherwise, in other words, since you're thinking otherwise, let me paraphrase this. If you're mature, think like me, and since you are thinking differently, God's going to show you you're wrong. One of the big problems at the church at Philippi was the lack of unity. They had their favorite leaders. They had their favorite personalities. Even when you get over in chapter 4, there were two veteran missionary women who were fighting and couldn't get along. There was some disunity at the church of Philippi. Why is that? Because they were focusing on the here and the now, not the then and there. And so Paul is saying, you need to run your race, and if you disagree, you're wrong. I like that. He just said, you know, you need, you, you're you not attaining what you're being attained for. You're thinking wrong. Wrongly, adverbs add the L-Y. You're thinking wrongly. You're not thinking clearly. And God's going to show you. Well, you, didn't you know that I got saved back in the Jesus movement in the 70s? Yeah, I've heard that story about 10 times. And how God used to use you and how you were part of the, uh, the hippie commune houses and you did these things and God gave a prophecy over your life and you did this and you did some things. But you know what? You can't get along with anybody. So are you really that mature? Guys, are we mature because we know the Bible or are we mature because we're more like Jesus? Let her be. <laughs> we're more mature if we look like Jesus. And some of these guys didn't look like Jesus and God needed to show them. And how does God show us sometimes? Through loneliness? Maybe God shows us because, you know, some friends are dropping off. Maybe God's showing us because we can't find a church that really understands us. <laughs> or a pastor that recognizes that we're, you know, super anointed. And um, Pastor Rob told me a story about a man back, in, back east who visited a lot of churches and um, he said that he was called to be a pastor and the pastor there wouldn't let him do anything and uh, I think as the story goes and uh, Rob said something like well you know how long have you had this calling on your life about 20 years and you've never been a pastor in 20 years no but God's called me and, and I'm, I'm like then so you're saying man men can defeat the call of God so people are keeping you back from being a pastor. Why don't you go stand out on the, on the street corner and go preach and gather a congregation and then go meet at the park. If you're a pastor, nobody can stop you. You guys following me? Sometimes you say, well, if only this or if only... The problem isn't with everybody else. Maybe the problem's with you. Maybe the problem's with me. And so I'm just thinking, if a guy's called to be a pastor, then go to the rescue mission and Preach. Go to the mall and preach. Go minister to people. Go to the hospital and pray for people. Don't blame other people that you, your, your calling is not being fulfilled. And so sometimes we think, you know, uh, verse 15 again, and if anything you think otherwise, God's going to show you. Somebody needs to show that, brother. Either you're not a pastor, brother, or you're not pastoring. Get out and pastor. Go find some people. Go under the bridge. There's people living there. Go take some hamburgers and share a Bible study with them. See what I'm saying? 
So sometimes we, th- why am I saying that? To make you feel bad? Yes, that's it. Welcome to Sunday morning. Hope you feel really bad. Church is no good unless you leave feeling really guilty. Okay. No, it's like, if you feel called to do something, then go do it. But if it's not working out, maybe say, God, help me examine myself. Is there something in me? Verse 15, am I not thinking correctly? God, show me. Is life being held back in my life? It can't be everybody else's fault. Maybe it's me. Is my marriage bad? Maybe, maybe I have something to do with that. Do I not get along with people at work? Maybe it's me. Maybe I'm not running in my lane. Maybe I'm trying to be somebody that I'm not. Lord, I want to, I want to be able to say in my life, this one thing I do, I'm going after you. Guys, if, if, we, if we can simplify our lives and have that one thing that we do is to go after Jesus, a lot of, a lot of pieces are going to fall into place. Sarah's own testimony, she didn't go to Romania to be something. She just was led to go to Romania. What are you going to do? I don't know. I'll show you when we get there. Probably something like that, right? I'll show you when we get there. Okay, I'll go. And all these years later, this two nonprofits and international ministry and all this stuff that God has done, we have to be able to say this one thing I do. And one thing can include a lot of things underneath it, but it has to have the banner, this one thing I do. So, how do we know if we're not pressing on like, like a runner? Well, the race will reveal it. <laughs> I went out and played frisbee golf with my brother-in-law. Uh, a couple of weeks ago down in Southern California. I have to kept it, I, I, I used to be really good at Frisbee. It was my major in college. And um, I was really good. But the older I get, the better I was, you know. And so I had to keep explaining to them, well, I have a torn bicep tendon. And I can't really, uh, I mean, I was imagining just sailing this thing. I used to be able to sail a Frisbee. And I just threw it and it went like, <laughs> I was like, Whoa. I have to make excuses, you know. By the end of the course, I started to loosen up, you know. I went home and took Advil and, you know. But sometimes we go through life and we keep making those excuses. This is why it isn't working out. This is why it isn't working out. And Paul said, you know what, maybe you're not as mature as you think, verse 15, and God needs to show you. We have negative examples in the Old Testament. Samson, tremendously gifted by God, a man of the flesh. King Saul, tremendously gifted by God, a man of the flesh. They didn't press on in God. They wasted their lives. It's a tragic thing to learn that you should have been pressing on. It's humiliating for the one who thought he was spiritually mature to find out that he's not. But guys, you know, there's a lot of, I'm, yes, I'm, yes, I'm kind of challenging you guys today, but, you know, here's the, here's the upside. We have today, don't we? And we have all the rest of the days of our lives to serve the Lord. Find out who you are in Jesus. First thing, identity. Find out where you can grow. You can grow here. And then find out how you can serve. Let those things happen. There's great fulfillment in life as we do those things. Look at verse 16 with me. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, and all of you here have attained to some degree. All of us have, have made some progress in life, haven't we, as, as far as our faith goes. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. So it isn't that we haven't done anything. I mean, I, I don't think anybody accidentally came here thinking it was farmer's market. <laughs> right? You guys all came here saying, I'm going to go to church today. I'm going to go worship the Lord. I'm going to learn. I'm going to love some people. I'm going to have some donuts. I'm going to hang out. We're going to be blessed. So we are attaining some things. So keep it up, but press forward. That's what Paul is saying to us. Look at verse 17. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. We have positive role models to follow. There's so many positive role models within the body of Christ. So pressing on for you, pressing on for me, means that we have godly examples and godly role models. And Paul was able to say, follow my example. What a thing to be able to say. Either he was extremely spiritually arrogant, (laughs) I don't think so, or by God's spirit, he could humbly proclaim himself a good example. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And he was a worthy example. And I I pray, you know, I heard somebody say it this way, it's good to have Christian heroes. 
So find some Christian heroes. My wife is an avid reader. If you need some good books to read, Debbie has read about so many of the saints throughout the life of the church. Great role models to follow. Look around here. Find some people to follow. Say, you know, I want to be like that person. Not that I envy their life, but I envy in a healthy, godly way what God is doing in them. Lord, use me like that. Change me like that. And I want to submit to you that if you have somebody that you really look up to, it's because they've had a lot of death to self. And you're seeing Jesus in them. There are negative role models, verse 18. Many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping. They are enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. This is horrible. Their God is their belly. Their glory is in their shame. We see a lot of that now, don't we? A lot of openly glorifying glorification of shame publicly, parades. A lot of media things. And they set their mind on earthly things. So apparently they were professors of religion, pretenders of faith. But Paul says they were actually enemies of the cross. They refused to carry their own cross. Their God wasn't Jesus. Their own gratification was their God. Their minds were not set on pressing on in Christ, but pressing on in sin. They were unregenerate, they were lost in their sins, their end was destruction. It says in the book of Genesis that when God created Adam and Eve, he created them uh, in his image, but then when Adam and Eve had children, they were created in the image of Adam with a propensity towards sin. Uh, you guys know that. With a, uh, hey, Joe, can you come and join us? with a propensity towards sin. You know, it's, it's just human nature to, to, to want to do the wrong thing. Um, I've told you guys my little story about when I was about eight years old, I was at Alpha Beta Market near Belinda with my mom, and we were going through the produce department, and they had potatoes in plastic bags, like a 10-pound bag, and they had little ventilation holes in the, in the bag so that it wouldn't get condensation. And I just thought, you know, I'm going to shove my finger in that hole just kind of route it out a little bit, kind of tear the bag a little. It just seemed like a good idea, you know. And uh, there were no signs that said, thou shalt not, you know, poke your finger in the potato bag hole. But I knew in my heart of hearts and my conscience, you know, and without anybody saying, I looked around to see if anybody was watching. And I thought no one was watching. I stuck my hand in that, tear that little bag up, you know, and the produce guy comes over and I'm in trouble and, you know. What's my point? My point is this. We have a propensity towards sin. If you're not intentional about following Jesus, all of Jesus, I'm not saying be intentional about following some of the Christian things that we do. It's not the same. You need to be intentional about following all of Jesus. Because if you don't, spiritual Gravity, if you will, is just going to bring you down. It's just going to happen. It just happens. Would you guys agree with me on that? Yeah. It happens. So we need to be very intentional. But what a blessing it is and what a, what a treat and what a, a gratifying and satisfying thing it is to say, Lord, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to follow you. Lord, that's our desire and that's our intention and we, we ask for your strength, God. And we know that your strength is there and you're energetically working in us to to cause us both to will and to do according to your good pleasure, Lord. Those desires that we have about godliness are from you. And the energy to carry it through, it's from you. But Lord, we still have our will, and so we want to surrender our wills, Lord, and follow you in everything, in the easy parts, in the difficult parts, Lord, that you may be glorified and that we can be greatly blessed. Father, bless each one here. Bring healing to Pastor Rob, Father, and, and uh, thank you that he's here leading this congregation. Thank you for his love for you his godliness, his, his vision, his, his forward thinking in all these things, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bless you guys.